Welcome to Theological Journals, Part 2. We're in Westminster Theological Journal, and we're reading an abstract of a recent doctoral dissertation. I will remove your proudly exultant ones, a study of inner biblical interpretation in Zephaniah. William Wood. The thesis examines the use of the Old Testament in Zephaniah using an author-oriented approach to inner biblical interpretation. In doing so, the regular use of the earlier Old Testament materials underscores the core of Zephaniah's message of the reversal of fortunes for the proud are humbled in judgment in the day of Yahweh and the humble remnant are exalted to the Holy Communion. The introductory chapter anchors this work in broader Zephaniah studies and shows the need for the present project as an area of research that has been re regularly acknowledged. Sounds a little bit like our Esther study. The reversal motif that has been regularly acknowledged but not fully explored. Chapter 2 then analyzes the theory of inner biblical interpretation, placing the present work within the author oriented approaches but qualified by a redemptive historical hermeneutic. Finally, the main bodies, chapters 3 to 8 examines the various proposals for source texts in Zephaniah by focusing on the lexical and syntactical connections while also examining the contextual and thematic relation between Zephaniah and source texts. Each connection is categorized as a quotation, allusion, echo, or trace before proposing the interpretive significance within Zephaniah. Finally, a brief conclusion in chapter 9 summarizes the findings of the thesis, arguing that an understanding of Zephaniah's use of earlier Old Testament texts significantly enhances the prophet's theological message that on the day of Yahweh, those who are proudly self-exalted will be humbled by Yahweh. But those who humble themselves will be exalted, exultant, and exalted over by Yahweh. Sounds like a fascinating doctoral piece of work. We turn now to Mid-America Theological Journal with Dr. Cornelius Vanema. Turretin begins his treatment of the fifth proposition by reiterating how the spirit and word concur in effectual calling. Since faith comes by hearing and hearing comes through the word of God, God treats those he calls as rational creatures according to the constitution of the covenant of grace. Therefore, he draws lost sinners to himself in the covenant of grace by means corresponding to the nature of those he addresses. That the word is the means of God uses instrumentally and effectual calling is especially evident in the manner, from the manner in which adults are brought into fellowship with God. Nonetheless, the efficacy of the call does not reside in the word alone since the word does not possess the inherent power to bring about the conversion of lost sinners. The word proclaims the gospel call to faith and repentance, but left to itself remains insufficient to bring lost sinners to conversion. No matter how clearly and compellingly the word is proclaimed, and in whatever the circumstances, the word cannot produce conversion unless the secret ineffable and hyper-physical operation of the spirit attends to affect the soul immediately and turns it by omnipotent power. 
the burden of turret in the fifth proposition is that there are two prerequisites to the conversion of lost sinners. First, they must be called through the gospel to faith and repentance. And second, they must have the receptivity or faculty to do what the call requires. Regarding the second of these, no lost sinner who is spiritually dead has the facility to hear and respond appropriately to the gospel call. As such, and so great is the corruption introduced into the soul by sin, that although there always remains in it natural power of understanding and willing, still the moral habit or disposition of judging and willing properly has so failed that it can no longer move to the right exercise of itself by the presentation of the object, unless the faculty itself is renovated. On this account, there is always a twofold grace in the conversion of man, the one objective and extrinsic, consisting in the proposition of the object, with the other subjective, acting immediately on the faculty to render it capable of receiving the ob object, not only that it may rightly elicit its own acts in reference, but elicit them actually. Each of them depends upon the Holy Spirit working in two ways, both in the word and in the heart. In the word as the objective cause, in the heart as the efficient cause of faith. In the word, acting morally by the revelation of the object and suasion, in the heart working efficaciously and hyperphysically by an infusion of good habits, the creation of a new heart, and the powerful impression of the proposed object. We turn to Global Anglicanism, the journal, the continuing discussion on Socinianism, which evacuates the Trinity, the doctrine of sin, the atonement, Christology, and now post-lapsarian. This is with Rich Duncan on John, John Owens and the danger of Biblicism. Oh, hi, Mary. Good to see you. Um, we're, we're back at work trying to see improvements that we are seeing some. It seems like many Arminians, the Socinians, simultaneously hold too low a view of mankind before the fall and too high a view of humanity after the fall. It is perhaps helpful to begin with the latter since it was the primary, primary anthropological tactic of the Socinians to downplay the consequence of man's fall. They contended that children are born in the same state in which Adam lived before his disobedience. So it's like Pelagius. Freedom of the will, that is, the image of God, remains intact. Lavink explains the impact of this position upon the rest of Socinian thinking. If Adam did not fall, or did only fall in part, deprive the will of freedom and power to do good, then it is in the same measure grace became dispensable. This is exactly what happened in Socinianism. To the extent that the seriousness of sin was diminished, so too was the miracle of salvation. Burkhoff and Ferguson respectively point that out, that for sinners, the Socinians, the sinners' justification and regeneration are made possible, merely on the ground of their own repentance and reformation. In one of Owen's discussions of the Holy Spirit's work, he demonstrates well this link between the doctrine of sin and the question of whether regeneration involves the synergistic cooperation of God and humanity. The underpinning of Socinianism's rejection of grace is, according to Owen, the denial of the full reality of original sin and innate corruption. Prelapsarian. 
the overly positive post-lapse area in anthropology of the Socinians complemented the overtly negative pre-lapse area in vision. For instance, according to the Socinians and some of the earlier Arminians, the image of God consists in man's dominion. By limiting the imago dei to liberty of the will, a quality they believe readily apparent in all humanity, it served well their anti-atonement agenda, but unwittingly undermined their foundational notion of the unfettered will of God. Flying in the face of their theology proper in this way, their affirmation of mankind's absolute autonomy led them to denounce the doctrine of predestination and even the reformed account of the permissive will in relation to evil. Indeed, their assertion of individual freedom exceeded even that of contemporary Arminians, since they denied not only God's predestination, but also denied God's exhaustive foreknowledge of the free action of creatures. And we'll switch glasses here. You see, Mary, I just received the Global Anglican Summer Edition and the Westminster Theological Journal Spring Edition. You're ahead of me there, Mary. I don't think I have. Yes, I have. The, we're working on the Spring Edition of the, for the Global Anglican, but on Westminster Journal, I'm still working on the Fall Edition. It, I guess it's coming here sometime. We're working through that we're at the end of the fall edition, looking at doctoral dissertations, abstracts of them. We now turn to, and you're reading some good stuff. You're getting table talk too. That's that's a nice volume. But we turn to the fundamentals of 1909. This was delightful to discover. Uh, these were a group of scholars who saw the the higher critics coming and destroying biblical faith. And this is a four volume set. And we're just delighted. We're with Professor George Wright talking about Pentateuchal higher criticism. He's made the point that they don't do very well in the area of textual criticism. They don't do well. They're arbitrary and literary criticism. Now his third point, misunderstanding legal forms in the sacrificial system. They'd be anti-atonement people. Another source of fallacious reasoning into which these critics have fallen arises from an understanding of the sacri misunderstanding of the sacrificial system of the Mosaic law. The destructive critics assert that there was no central sanctuary in Palestine until several centuries after its occupation under Joshua, and that at a later period all sacrifices by the people were forbidden except at the central place when offered by the priests, unless it was where there had been a special theophany. But these statements evince an entire misunderstanding or misrepresentation of the facts. In what the critics reckon as the oldest documents, J and E, the people were required three times a year to present themselves with sacrifices and offerings at the house of the Lord. Before the building of the temple, the house of the Lord was at Shiloh, Joshua judges for Samuel. The truth is that the destructive critics upon this point make a most humiliating mistake in repeatedly substituting sanctuaries for altars, assuming that since there was a plurality of altars in the time of judges, there was therefore a plurality of sanctuaries. They've completely misunderstood the permission given in Exodus 20:24. 20, An altar of the earth thou shalt make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen in all places. 
that's the authorized version. The revised version says, in every place. Where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou make me an altar stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stones. In reading this passage, we are likely to be misled by the erroneous translation. Where the revisers read in every place, and the authorized version in all places. <laughs> the correct translation is in all the place, or in the whole place. The word is in the singular and has a definite article before it. The whole place referred to is Palestine, the Holy Land. Or sacrifices such as the patriarchs had offered were always permitted to laymen, provided they made use only of an altar of earth or unhewn stones, was kept free from the adornments and accessories of heathen altars. These lay sacrifices were recognized in Deuteronomy as well as Exodus. But altars of earth and unhewn stone often used for the nonce only, and having no connection with the temple of any sort, are not houses of God, and will not become such on being called sanctuaries by critics several thousand years after they have fallen out of use. We'll pick that up next time as we turn to theologians that you should know by Dr. Mike Reeves, and he's got a number of glorious uh, YouTubes, Michael Reeves, R-E-E-V-S, and he does a number of church history studies there that I would refer people to. Um, he's an Englishman. Um, I think he may be Church of England, but he's sober and salutary. He's still talking here about Justin Martyr, who dies about 165 A.D. or so. And he's got a first and second apology, and now he's talking about the, his discussion with a rabbi by the name of Trifo. Justin is drawn in to look at the appearances of God in the Old Testament. Then I replied, he's a dialogue now, Reverting to the scriptures, I shall endeavor to persuade you that he who is said to have appeared to Abraham and to Jacob and to Moses and who is called God is distinct from him who made all things, numerically I mean, not distinct in will. Starting with Genesis 18 and 19, Justin argues that God appeared to Abraham along with two angels. Yet from Genesis 19.24, where the Lord rained down sulfur from the Lord, it can be seen that he is distinct from the Lord in the heavens, for there are a number of persons associated with one another who can be called Lord and God. He also refers to Genesis 1.26, 3.22, Psalm 45.6 and 7, 1.10, verse 1. Because of this, the Lord and God who appeared to Abraham and who is distinct from the Lord and God in the heavens can be called the angel or messenger of the Lord. He also examines Genesis 31, 32 to see more about this angel. Justin's point is that God the Father is utterly transcendent and invisible in the heavens. However, he is made known by his Logos, or angel, who appeared to God to make God known to the patriarchs and prophets and took flesh for our salvation. It's a pre-incarnate operations of Jesus. To support his case that Jesus was the Logos, or the angel, Justin explains that Jesus is the name of God. God said in Exodus 23, 20, 21, that his name would be in the one sent ahead of Israel to lead them into the promised land. That one was Hosea, whose name was changed in Numbers 13, 60 to Joshua, the Hebrew form of Jesus. 
Jewish failure to notice this, Justin argues, only betrays their willful ignorance of the scripture. For while they carefully study Abram's name was changed to Joshua, they do not think why Hosea's name was changed to Joshua. Jesus' name does mean Joshua. Turn now to Princeton Theological Review of 2007 with Sharon Baker's Anti-Atonement Socinian. She's a Socinian. A uh, few thoughts here. Be glad when we're done with this. That's why it's important to understand Socinianism. Uh, it's a readjustment of God's character. In fact, I believe that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection not only reversed the human conception of retributive justice to conceptions of reconciling justice and the creation of a new relationship with God, but in so doing, Jesus demonstrated how we are to negotiate our relationship with others seeking reconciliation, restoration, and peace rather than retribution through warfare or terrorism. Remember at the beginning, she pinned all war and all warfare all through the century willy-nilly upon the Christian church. It was just way out of line. She didn't have a very good start in this article. Thomas Aquinas, although wrapped up in notions of predestination, believes strongly in the significance of prayer in the life of God and divine governance of the world. Aquinas believed that divine providence does not take any away secondary causes. In other words, for Aquinas, prayer affects God in the manner in which God takes care of the world. We've got some footnotes here. Weingarten, the logic of divine love. Uh, Abelard, she's with Abelard again, and Aquinas notes that the love of God compels us and that in Christ we have our example. 67, the Thomistic notion of redemption based upon the merit earned by Christ and applied to our count is one of the areas in which I depart from Aquinas and the history of the church. Not just Aquinas, but Augustine and the medieval period as well, Luther, Calvin, and the whole thesis of the, the whole view of the church is that Jesus died penally for our sins and as our substitute. She doesn't like it. Quinn argues that God has made his transformative love available to all humanity churched or unchurched, Christian or unchristian, good and evil. Uh, he claims Aquinas that even predestination of members of the human race is ameliorated by the prayers of the saints. Aquinas also claimed that reason was superior to and more godlike than emotion, very Aristotelian there. He asserted, therefore, that prayer is an intellectual act brought one closer to God, thereby increasing the likelihood that God would look fair, favorably on the desires of the praying person. Aquinas believed, in addition, that because God loves us, it is appropriate to divine goodness for him to fulfill the desires of a rational creature when they are presented to him through prayer. Abelard, she's an Abelard denied the atonement too. So she's not just Socinian, but she's Abelardian. Also asserts that the prayers of Jesus offered from a loving heart on behalf of all humanity. Uh, she obviously hasn't read John 17. I pray for my, my own. I do not pray for the world. She is just not well trained. He writes that indeed his supreme righteousness requires that his prayer should not be rejected at any point. Be glad we're done with Sharon Baker of Princeton. 
We turn now to Jay Fesco's article as he's doing a reconnaissance tour of exegetical treatments of Romans 1, 3, and 4. <clears throat> and he's doing that before he will finally get into his thesis on Gerhardus's Voss's exegesis. There are some outliers and slight variations among post-Reformation interpreters such as Johannes Cosius, 1603-1669. Like earlier interpreters, Cosius addresses the question of Christ's two natures. But unlike earlier theologians, he traces Christ's human nature through redemptive history as the promised seed the seed of Abraham, Genesis 22, and the universal scope of blessing that came through them, which appears in Psalm 8, 6, the Son of Man. This redemptive historical line lies behind the phrase that Jesus descended from David according to the flesh, which pulls other significant biblical texts in its wake. Genesis 49, 10, 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 132, a messianic psalm, Matthew 1, and the genealogy of Luke 3. Cosias offers an equally expansive horizontal explanation of verse 4's statement about Christ's resurrection. Like Calvin's earlier exegesis, God raised Christ from the dead as a confirmation of his divine promises, Psalm 16, Isaiah 53, Acts 17. But the resurrection also confirmed the outpouring of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, first announced by the prophets and the fact that Jesus is the Lord, a whole bunch of references. So while Cosias follows the common track of the vertical interpretation, he also explores the horizontal lines of the text by tracing promise and fulfillment. Another outlier is the commentary of Andrew Willett, 1562 to 1621, who offers somewhat unique comments given that he surveys the history of interpretation. Christ was descended from David according to the flesh which points to the Spirit's work in incarnation and Christ's human nature, features noted by interpreters such as Chrysostom, 347 to 407 AD, Origen, 184 to 253 AD, and Theodore Beza, 1519 to 1605, Calvin's successor at Geneva Academy. More specifically, Augustine, 354 to 430 AD argues that this phrase addresses the virgin birth of Christ. Well, that also searches through other commentators such as Ambrose of Milan, 340 to 397 AD, who recognizes that Christ's genealogy was traced back to Joseph and Mary, both of whom were descendants of David. When Paul says that Christ was declared to be the Son of God by power of the Spirit's resurrection, interpreters usually appeal to three elements to prove that the Son's divine nature, the power of miracles, the Holy Spirit, and Christ's claim that he would raise himself, points raised by Chrysostom Andreas Hyperius, 1511 to 64, and Benedict de Regis, 1522 to 74. But Wallet avers that a slightly better path of interpretation addresses that the resurrection proclaims the divine nature of the spirit of sanctification, whereby he sanctified his own flesh and that of his mystical body, the church. Well, that surveys a number of interpretations that seek to explain Paul's reference to the Holy Spirit 
and argues that the spirit of sanctification refers not to the Holy Spirit, but to Christ's divine nature. Sounds exactly like Calvin and Luther to me. He believes this is the case between because of the two other statements in Scripture, namely that Christ was justified in the Spirit, 1 Timothy 3.16, and that he offered himself up in sacrifice through the eternal spirit, Hebrews 9, 14. That is, by the power of his divine spirit, he sanctifies his own body, his own hypostasis, and consequently his mystical body, the church. Willett mines this interpretation from Biza, Perez, and Ambrose. And next time we'll pick up Matthew Henry, whom we're working with in the morning, and Robert Haldane. Now we turn to confessional loyalty by Reverend Sean Murray in Concordia Theological Journal. And we think he's sustained his thesis on the necessity for confessional subscription, in his case, the Lutheran Confessions. We pick up here again. There's a move afoot to reject the Lutheran Confession's doctrine of the ministry as a purely European phenomenon that doesn't work here in the 21st century America. We cannot consider our theological, theologically sturdy way of training clergy to be faithful confessors to some Europeanized pedagogical method are somewhat removed from the European educational scene, not to mention the fact that both our seminaries have revised their curricula in the last 20 years. We may ask what would be placed in the gap created by the rejection of the Confession's doctrine of the ministry as a European construct. It would be replaced by an American pragmatic doctrine of ministry. It would not be a a biblical doctrine. Junking our confessional doctrine of the ministry by labeling our theologically rigorous preparation of theological candidates would make us nothing but schismatics. And we do recognize the great scholarly attainments of those who go through Concordia. Um, they're cousins to the reform, but there are very different, some very, very strong differences. But they lent their shoulder to the defense of sacred scripture as the higher critical vandals and Visigoths were turning up in the late 19th, early 20th century. They really did some good homework. Back to Sean Murray. Yes, of course, the confession's doctrine of the ministry doesn't appear to work. In the jaundiced view of some, it is keeping the church from growing. I submit that a standard that confessional statements are required to conform to external definitions of success is not driven by the Bible, but by the American philosophy of pragmatism championed by John Dewey and William James. In American pragmatism, truth is not a static set of statements, but an ever-flowing flow of ideas, ever-changing flow of ideas, the value of which is only certain according to their outcomes. For James, truth is the cash value of an idea. Most crassly stated, a thing is true only when it can be shown externally to be successful or make money. This is a uniquely American philosophy in which every American is swimming, whether he knows it or not. Pragmatism asks, does it work? As an example, Tom Wenger asked about the formula of concord the bottom line of any doctrine is not its correctness but its effect its results this is a false dichotomy at best certainly good theology saves but good theology is good because it is corrected correct we'll do.
picked that up again. We think he's sustained his thesis. Journal of Theological Studies, 1908. A lot of long talking here. On this rock, I will build my church. <clears throat> He's made God the rock, not Peter. It remains to ask how and whom it is said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The last word is ambiguous. It may refer either to the rock or to the ecclesia. If this rock it be distinguished from Simon the rock, it becomes easier to regard it as the heir of this promise rather than the ecclesia. The gates of Hades or Sheol stand for the power of death. Readily they open to, to all corners, but none may go out. Hezekiah, whom some long after pronounced to have been Messiah, said, when he lay dying, as he thought, in the tranquility of my days, I shall go into the gates of Sheol. For him, look, there was little hope of resurrection, general or particular. By the sage who wrote in the name of Solomon, found faith, thou hast authority over life and death, and thou leadest into the gates and leadest up. But there's no footnote here. Though the rock pass in and through the inexorable portal, it is written, Thou shalt not leave my soul in Sheol, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. That's applied to Jesus by the apostles. To Jesus the gates of death opened in fear, and the guard keepers of Hades uh, shuddered. He then, who according to scripture must suffer and be the first to rise from the dead, the crucified and risen Messiah. He is the true rock upon whom the church that God shall build and against whom the gates of hell shall not prevail. In parables, Justin said in his controversy with Trifo, we were just studying just Justin Martyr and his dialogue with Trifo. The Christ was proclaimed stone and rock through the prophets, and there Justin does not agree with the Bishop of Rome. But 80 to 90% of the church fathers all agree with Justin Martyr, a nice little fact that is camouflaged and covered up. The word kipha covers and contains both rock and stone. And there's an echo of kipha in the promise. The gates of hell shall not conquer it. For the Greek, kata shall conquer, is that which the Septuagint uses to render the Hebrew word hazak. And the Aramaic equivalent is furnished by the Onkelos version. This echo would seem to require the identification of the ambiguous aotes with the rock. Or if the mechanical accumulation of the evidence from the Septuagint and Targum of Onkelos be unacceptable, there's Kafa, a still more faithful echo of Kifa. And bring that article to an end. There'll be a new article next time on Papias. That'll, that looks exciting. Turn now to Pro Protestant Reform Theological Journal, and it's an article on the Trinity. Um, just a little bit here. What about the Holy Spirit? He's talked about Father and Son. Here we find one of the most amazing truths of the Trinity a truth that we can understand to a certain degree, but that we cannot comprehend from the Latin cum with and prehendere to take or embrace, comprehend. The Holy Spirit is the love of God. He is the personal bond of love between the Father and Son. The Father and the Son love each other in the Spirit. The Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. 
the Father delights in the Son, and the Son delights in the Father. This is done in the Spirit, and proceeds from the Father to the Son, and from the Son to the Father. Love and communion between first and second persons of the Trinity is a person. The love that is the bond of perfection which the saints practice with one another is the vestigium trinitactus. It is the trace of that perfect love that the Father and the Son mutually breathe to one another in the Holy Spirit. It is archetypal and personal love, love in the most absolute sense. And we come to Thamelios, this great article, Conclusion. The reversal motif in Esther, we think he has adequately, potently, overpoweringly sustained his thesis of the great reversal motif between Haman and Mordecai and the Jews that are on the block for province-wide slaughter of Jews is reversed and Haman the Agadite that long, that long lineage of hostility toward the Jews is completely eradicated. Conclusion. As this article has labored to demonstrate, it is not entirely, entirely accurate to say that the author of Esther gives no literary place to God or God's sovereign work. I should hope not. To be sure, the author may have had a purpose in not explicitly mentioning God. That's one of the unique char a unique characteristic of Esther. It does not bring up Elohim or Jehovah. However, his use of the great reversal motif powerfully brings God into the foreground. That's what I've always thought. As it is God who sovereignly brings about such a reversal. Abraham Wintzer agrees, Israel's deity is indeed to be found in Esther, even if on the face of it his presence is only alluded to by Mordecai's faithful words and loyal conduct. The story of a lofty, self-exalting prince, Haman, being brought low, while a humble Jew who sits in the dust is exalted to princely place mandates the conclusion that it is God who did it, thus proving that the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. Evil men may cast poor, but it is the Lord who sovereignly determines the result, Proverbs 16.32. Esther powerfully shows that it is the sovereign God of Israel who will humble the self-exalting and exalt the humble, no matter how many lots may be cast. He alone brings his poor people from ashes to glory, from fasting to feasting, and he alone can cause them to rise from the dust, to sit with princes. It is through the great reversal theme evidenced by Mordecai the Jew rising up from the dust to inherit glory and the proud Haman falling in disgrace. That Esther proves that even if hidden, God is still present to the believer. In the final evaluation then, the book of Esther contributes to the canon by calling God's people to be humble and to a faithful dependence on Yahweh who while at times unseen, knows and weighs the actions of all people. In his sovereignty, the Lord will bring about the great reversal, thereby securing redemption for those who trust in him and bringing about the fall of all who arrogantly oppress them. Thus, by using the reversal theme that was established in the book of Samuel, and I'm not sure of that connection I did that little slice I had rather question, but not the overall thesis. The author of Esther testifies to all, for the pillars of the Lord are, 
of the earth are the Lord's, and he on them he has set the world. And that's the end of that glorious article. Our next we'll be taking up with Ben Sira's canon conscious interpretive strategies, his narrative history and the realization of Jewish scriptures by Peter Beckman, PhD candidate in St. Paul University, Ottawa, Ontario. And now we turn to the New Horizons publication of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And it was talking about diaconal ministries. Expecting Christ's finished church, our regular celebration of God's former work keeps us firmly expecting him to finish. It's very practical. By faith, we pray and plan for the near future. By the time you read this article, we trust that God will have placed our church in its new location or will be drawing others to Christ. By September, we hope to have a new missionary couple working alongside us. This time next year, another ruling elder and deacon will be added. Lord willing to our church leadership. Within two years, we envision a church plant t taking place, taking shape in the vicinity of someone, the neighbor's home. This is, I'm not sure where this is at. It's five years down the road, we trust that Salvos Por Grazia will enjoy a membership of 50, be financially self-supporting, have its own reformed pastor and be working together with a sister church of 20 members. Beyond this, a presbytery of six reformed and Presbyterian churches would be ordaining its own pastors and planting other churches. However lofty these goals seem in this atheistic culture, and this looks like a Spanish context here, we trust to the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. And this is why I like reading these, because it's front lines. It's where the ministry is going on. We do all this wonky-tonky stuff, but we got to remember that if we can't sit on the floor and talk to the children about theology, we're not a doctor of theology. So it's exciting to see people on the front lines just so encouraging and plain talk too without the wonky tonky we got to have got to have all of it got to be able to stand on the bridge of a ship and talk to the admiral on an aircraft carrier or the captain or the air boss or the senior officers but you got to go down into the bilge of the ship and talk to seaman seaman sam We're Bishop Latimer guys. We like it plain talk. God's dwelling with his people. And so we persevere now in the work, remembering his faithfulness while expecting future glory. What a life transforming perspective. Our Savior never designs our trials to defeat us, but to direct us toward his final goal. Last September, Salvos Por Grazia lost its missionaries when we, they. We went back to the States for four months furlough. Though we were unable to work with them, Jesus was working in them. Worship continued under the elders' direction while weekly Bible studies were led by another potential church officer. They met each other's needs, fellowship together, and paid all the bills on time. All this took place while the missionaries were thousands of miles away. This is in Montevideo, Uruguay. I got a little note here. Whether they realize it or not, they were taking one giant step towards becoming their own church. And now Salvos Por Gracias has lost its building. What we first believed to be a major obstacle, we now see as an open door moving them out of their building. Christ is moving them to a new place, which is more affordable, as they learn to take greater ownership of their meaning. 
our mission will help them further ownership of their life and leadership of the church itself. Apart from their loss, they may never have thought to move in a new direction. Our perseverance today depends on remembering Christ's past faithfulness in order to expect future fulfillment. Isn't it much like coming to the sacrament of the Lord's table? There we participate in Christ's body and blood, rejoicing in his already finished work while setting our hearts on the wedding feast of the Lamb where we, have all, where we are already fully, but yet not finally, seated. We'll pick up this again. It's so refreshing. And now for Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies on the Catholic Church, and we're listening to a Roman Catholic scholar, professor of New Testament, doing a little bit of wonky. It's very hard to follow because he's going getting into the techno mumbo jumbo. So let's pick up here. The limits of this presentation will only allow me to give one brief example to illustrate the dynamic correlation between Christ and the church, and hence between fullness in Christ, the concrete universal and fulfillment. Resourcement is at the heart of this dynamic correlation. Lumen Gentium states that the church is at one and the same time holy and always in need of being purified, sanctissimul et sepper purificanda, and incessantly pursues the path of penance and renewal. In Unitatis Red Integratio, the council states that the church is called to continual reformation. This is a Roman Catholic document. Furthermore, several other paragraphs of Lumen Gentium makes clear that purification, renewal, and reformation of the church is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit guides the church into the fullness of truth. By the power of the gospel, he makes the church grow, perpetually renews her. That moved by the Holy Spirit, she may never cease to renew herself until through the cross she arrives at the light, which knows no setting. Finally, Lumen Gentum, paragraph 12, states that the gifts of the Spirit among Christ's faithful renders them fit and re ready to undertake the various tasks and offices which help the renewal and upbuilding of the church. The Second Vatican Council focused not only on the dynamics of the her hermeneutics of reform and renewal, but also on the development in her understanding of the truth. This is evident in the Vatican decree on ecumenism all Catholics, it would be Roman, are led to examine their own faithfulness to Christ's will for the church and accordingly to undertake with vigor the task of renewal and reform. Christ summons the church to continual reformation as she sojourns here on the earth. Thus, if in various times and circumstances there have been deficiencies, in the way that church teaching has been formulated to be carefully distinguished from the deposit of faith itself, these can and should be set right at the opportune moment. Having said that about Vatican II, let's not forget JP II and Benedict XVI's constant reaffirmation of the Council of Trent. And I lived in Naples, Italy, uh, 1997 to 2000, when JP2 was in Rome. And he offered, a, you know, plenary indulgence, you know, show up in Rome for the millennial stuff and you, all your sins are remitted in this, in the temporal dimension of the penalty of sin. It was a way to buff up the numbers but I can still remember hearing repeatedly 
the reaffirmation of the Council of Trent. With some nice happy talk, perhaps. Happy clappy talk in the yoga center. Elsewhere, but this much, they made the Bible available to Roman Catholics in their native language. That's like 500. I grew up in the time period where that wasn't allowed. So we wonder what might happen. I, I know Dr. O. Palmer Robertson, Old Testament man at Westminster, wondered where things would go. I remember a Filipino Roman priest telling me he had the same idea. Where is this all going to go now that the toothpaste is out of the tube? Won't go back in. Anyways, back to this. We'll Elsewhere in the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Deum Verbum, we read, for as there is a growth in the understanding of the realities and the words of divine revelation, which have been handed down. And they've got this co-equal thing, Bible as authority and the tradition, the magisterium, co-equal. Whereas the centuries succeed one another, the church constantly moves forward forward towards the fullness of divine truth until the words of God reach their complete fulfillment in them. And he'll pick up a comment on my classmate, Kevin Van Hoosier. We'll pick that up next time. Turn to Reform Presbyterian Journal 1837. Lovely brief outline of Reverend James Smith. Um, talking about the sovereignty of God's word that goes everywhere to the highest precincts of life into the chambers of kings as well as to the lowest echelon of life, if we can use that. Now he brings up the supremacy of Christ, Reverend Smith. Again, this is 1837, and I'm delighted to report that these American covenanting Presbyterians are still faithful loyal, devoted Bible Presbyterians. I'm not Presbyterian, but I love I love them. And just delighted to read and find this. And them, they have a seminary up just a little north of Pittsburgh. A friend of mine attended there. The Sepra and, and I have some Presbyterianism in the family line back to 1921. Um, and then my dad, and then I was raised in it. But I shifted over kind of to the Anglican. I'm a prayer book guy, so I have some Anglican. I have that in the family history, too, in the 19th century. So I'm, I'm a little of each. The supremacy of Christ. The scriptures abundantly declare that Christ is king in Zion and to the ends of the earth. Jehovah says in Psalm 2, yet... Notwithstanding the opposition of all enemies, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. God gave him to be head over all things to the church. All persons, all blessings, all dispensations are put under Jesus' control. The witnesses should testify against all Erastian encroachments. There's the Scottish objection to the supremacy of the state over the church in the Church of England. And these covenanters raised the heroic standard against that relationship that still exists in England. And I'm with the Scots on this. Keep the state out of the church. Um, but this is Erastianism. So this is very, uh, gives you a real sense of a historic moment. It's been said that the American Revolution was really a Presbyterian's war. No more king. God gave him to be head over all things to the church. The witnesses should testify against all Erastian encroachments. All attempts to transfer the royal prerogatives of King Jesus to an earthly crown. The glorious sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ as the alone king and head of his church is sadly encroached upon and opposed by the royal supremacy in causes ecclesiastical. 
the king is acknowledged as the supreme head or governor on earth of the churches of England and Ireland. The civil, again, this is 1837. The civil sovereign is thus declared to be the head or the fountain of church power and constituted the judge in controversies of religion. Henry VIII. Hey, Dr. Bob, good to see you. Just working our way toward the close here, another 10 or 15 minutes. Talking about these Scots Presbyterian, American Presbyterians, but they would be of Scotch descent and influence. Henry VIII transferred the supremacy from the Pope's crown to his own head. The Church of Scotland has also subjected and subordinated their ecclesiastical meetings to civil power. Cargill, in his last testimony, says, This is the magistracy I have rejected that was invested with Christ's power. And seeing that power taken from Christ, which is his glory, and made the essential of the crown, there's no distinction we can make that can free the conscience of the acknowledger from being a partaker of this sacrilegious robbing of God. By this, the fountain of church power and authority is lodged in the king's person, and Christ deprived of his dignity and dethroned as head and king of Zion. And we'll pick that up again. I agree with this cover. And now for Dr. Beale, he's a Reformed seminary writing in a Baptist journal on the use. He's a recognized scholar on the book of Revelation, and he's made his point that Ezekiel is extremely influential in the writing of the book. There's a consensus that the plagues of the trumpets in Revelation 8, 6 through 12, and those of the bowls in 16, 1 to 9, follow the paradigm of the Exodus plagues and trials, Exodus 7 through 14, though they are creatively reworked and applied. Beasley Murray cared sweet. Already this Exodus model had been used in Amos 8 and 9, creatively applied in Wisdom 11 and 19, the latter perhaps influencing John's application. And this raises, how did John write Revelation? Did he have the vision and then come back and do the writing? Exactly how was the process, if we can go there? I've never really digested that. J.S. Casey has argued for a significant influence of Exodus typology in the trumpets and bowls, as well as in other segments of Revelation. Draper proposes that the eschatological scheme in Zechariah 14 provides the basis for midrashic development of Revelation 7. And Sweet, he was a scholar at Canterbury, He's buried up at St. Martin's in Kent there, that ancient church just about a mile east of the cathedral. While Sweetmore, and he's got a, a good commentary on Revelation, while Sweetmore tentatively, tentatively suggests the same thing for Revelation 20 to 22. All of the above proposed Old Testament models have woven within them allusions from other parts of the same Old Testament book and from elsewhere in the Old Testament corpus. And many of these are based on common themes, pictures, catchphrases, and the like. And I would interject, reflects the beauty and the glory of the divine mind and its rich comprehension of the Holy Spirit who's able to grasp themes from all over the Bible and bring them to allude, uh, allude to them, make echoes explicit and implicit. And we're really talking about the brilliant genius of the triune God. On the reasonable assumption that these models were followed intentionally, two primary uses of them can be discerned. First, the Old Testament patterns appear to be used as forms 
through which future eschatological fulfillment is understood and predicted. Second, the prototypes are utilized as lenses through which past and present eschatological fulfillment is understood. Chapter 1, 4, and 5, we get the sovereign Jesus is the only one who can open the book of the infallible decrees. Oh my. I feel like Joe put my hand on my mouth and just quiet worship. <clears throat> it is not always clear whether these Old Testament prototypes <clears throat> are the means or the object of interpretation. The Old Testament interprets the New Testament, and the New Testament interprets the Old. We'll bring that to a close. It's a very provocative article in the good sense of the word provocative. Now for reform faith and practice and the discussion of Eugene Patterson's, uh, he was a Presbyterian minister who wrote a lot of books. One striking picture of the gospel emerges from Peterson's reflections on posture. In his chapter in Psalm 123, Peterson notes that the believer can approach God for mercy only from the posture of servitude. An approach that does not lift up the eyes of a servant will turn God into a servant at will turn God into a servant at our beck and call. The results are calamitous for discipleship. We should very soon become contemptuous of a God who we could figure out like a puzzle or learn to use like a tool. At the end of the book in Peterson's chapter in Psalm 134, we discover the posture of God who provides mercy. He is a covenant God who stands and stoops and stays. The elusiveness in classifying Peterson only adds to the pleasure of reading him. Forty years later, Long Obedience, written by Peterson in particular, endures as an edifying read, read for three reasons. First, it excels as a primer on Christian discipleship, distinguishing true discipleship from counterfeits. Second, it's a sampler that will introduce major themes in Peterson's writings, but most importantly, it will model and encourage followers to listen more carefully to Scripture, slowly, imaginatively, prayerfully, and obediently. And that's the end. We'll be picking up next time on some book reviews, which we always enjoy a little one pagers keeps us up to date on what's going on in terms of publication. And now for our final reading and this wonky tonky uh, internal debate within the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in 1837 does that, and that's the highest body, then presbyteries and then sessions at the local level. Do they have? The authority it was again 1837 to establish a board of foreign missions. Do they have the constitutional authority, or is that to be placed at the lower level in in presbyteries? So wonky tonky 1837. And after this is done, we're looking forward to it being done. We'll be picking up the case of Albert Barnes, pastor of. Arch Street Presbyterian, a historic church in Philadelphia, they brought him up on heresy charges. I, I think I've got a few of his books over in there. Um, I'm not sure what it is. I think it was Arminianism, but we'll see where that goes. So into this, our last article, Wonky Tonky. This is the Princeton Theological Review of 1837. Uh, we were reading in the same journal, 2007, with that Socinian Arminian Sharon Baker, who Antietone, she's Abelardian, she is not historic. Can't wait to finish that article either. We've had enough of Sharon Baker at Princeton Seminary. 
Jesus died for our sins and was risen for our justification. That's why we keep the Book of Romans the center of everything here. Not pushing other books to the side, but Book of Romans rules. Sin, justification, sanctification, glorification, predestination. And then come, do this, do that, and the other in, in Romans 12 through 16. Here we go, back to Princeton Journal, 1837, when they believed in the inerrancy of scripture, I might add. Maintained through J. Gresham Machen in the 1920s and 30s, and then Westminster Seminary, thankfully, gloriously, and is flourishing. This phrase may seem to be used by the writer in two senses. He's going dealing with Mr. Taylor. Boards thus appointed or recommended, he says, have no right to exercise the ecclesiastical authorities of the bodies appointing them, be the presbyteries. The assembly, as we have shown, possesses no authority which it can confer on such boards. The second sense in which the phrase is used seems to be having the right to exercise judicial functions. Thus, in answer to the argument that the assembly had the right to appoint a board of missions, since it was acknowledged to have the right to appoint a board of directors for a theological seminary, he answers, if these seminaries were established to exercise the ecclesiastical authority over the churches in any respect, which belongs to the bodies which have established them, they would be unconstitutional excrescences. Number six, there is still one other supposition left, and that is that the writer does not deny the right to appoint a board of missions, but simply such a board. This is the ground assumed on page 97. And we'll pick that up. Looking forward to finishing it. We'll call this to a close. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. If God freely gave up his son on our behalf, shall he not also give us freely all things? I'm convinced that nothing but nothing but nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and always will be, world without end. Amen. Good to see you all here. Good to see you, Dr. Bob and Mary. Glad, Mary, you're, you're getting that wonky-tonky Westminster Theological Journal and Global Anglican, which has a more practical flavor and more... If the Global Anglican's a good magazine, a good magazine, and so delightful to see. Um, what's the word I want? Evangelical, Bible believing, inerrancy, Anglicans—they exist, not in my part of the world. <clears throat> I'm in Episcopalianism, and oh my word, I don't know how long I'm. We got great music. The rector's very charitable, kind. Let's me talk. I talk with him. As far as the structure of the church, oh, good Lord, deliver us all. But Global Anglican is old school Anglicanism, prayer book, but then reformed. So, and then it's like the Southern Baptists. I've always had a little prejudice against them being of Canadian background. Um, my dad was not real excited about American Baptists or Southern Baptists, the Southern Baptists. But I have completely dialed back that view with the Southwestern Baptist Theological Journal. I mean, we're just getting sheer gold from those guys down there. I, I mean, I differ on baptism with them. But they're doing good academic work. It's very encouraging. Same with the Concordia Lutheran. I take severe issues with them on the ubiquity of Christ's body and the sacrament of Holy Communion. Take strong exception to their Arminianism, and they, oh, they choke when you call them Arminians. They just choke, and I know because I've got, <laughs> I've worked with uh, Lutheran Concordia men, um, but that, 
and they, with their famous single predestinarianism and attempt to deny that Luther was a double predestinarian. So I've had a lengthy conversation with them, but where they are brothers in terms of their defense of the inerrancy, infallibility, perspicuity, authority of the canonical 66 books, which unites, I don't know, you call it evangelical, but I'm, I'm not Baptist, I'm not Pentecostal or charismatic, anything in that uh, arena. Anyways, good to see you all, and we'll talk to you later. Godspeed.